Hello and uh, welcome uh, from me, Michael Scott in the UK, and from my joint convener, Sanford J. Ungar in Washington, DC, to this, the 30th jointly promoted event between the Future of the Humanities Project and the Free Speech Project. The latter is sponsored by Georgetown University and the former by Georgetown's Humanities Initiative in association with Campion Hall, Oxford, and the Las Casas Institute for Social Justice, Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. Together, the two projects consider issues concerning human dignity, rights, cultures, histories, traditions, and freedoms in a wide spectrum of educational activity, policy, expression, and aspiration. In a moment, I'll hand over to Sandy, who is the director of the Free Speech Project. He will introduce today's distinguished guests and moderate the ensuing discussion before I return to chair the question and answer session. From the start, you can type in questions to the panel by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A button and not the chat button. These questions will come to me during the session and I will try and put them to the panel to consider later on. We urge you to ask questions as and when they occur to you so that there's not a backlog at the end. So I hope you enjoy today's debate. Over to you, Sandy. Thank you very much, Mike. Wonderful to be working together again on this extended series of international dialogues. We have a panel today we're very pleased to present. This is the third in our programs dealing with issues of democracy. Uh, we did one on Brazil two months ago, on Israel last month. Uh, Iran today is slightly different theme because we're not sure what democracy means in Iran. We'll talk about that. And there will be others coming up in the future. On May 3rd, we'll talk about World, World Press Freedom Day. But I'm very happy to introduce today uh, Senem Naragi Anderlini, who is founder and CEO of the International Civil Society Action Network, or ICANN, and adjunct professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. Mar Marjan Kipur is a human rights activist and advocate for women and minorities in Iran. She's the founding director of the Alliance for Rights of All Minorities and uh, joins us today from New York. Uh, Fatani Mogadam is our colleague at Georgetown University, professor of psychology, returning to our international dialogues, I believe, for the second time on subjects of mutual interest, and we're glad to have you back, Ali. Uh, Michael Nazir Ali is president of the Oxford Center for Training, Research, Advocacy, and Dialogue, or Oxtrad, I believe you would say, and uh, was the 106th bishop of Rochester in the UK for 15 years until 2009. He has both a Christian and Muslim family background and has sat in the House of Lords, British and Pakistani citizenship and extremely qualified to look at some of these issues from multiple perspectives. I wanna begin by asking each of you to, uh, how you would personally characterize the crisis going on in Iran today. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt there's a crisis in Iran and uh, that a lot of people are worried because of Iran's nuclear program and, and other reasons. But I wonder what all it is we need to be worrying about, what characterizes today's crisis. Senem, do you want to begin? Thank you. Uh, that's a big question to start off with, and I'm sure I won't have um, a complete answer. But the way um, I would say, it, I mean, I think there are different different perspectives on this. So. On the one hand, one of one of the things which makes the um, what I would call the women women life freedom movement different um, to past events is that this is a culmination of three three at least three generations of women since the start of the Iranian Revolution and the Islamic Republic. That culmination of these of, of three generations of women coming out and demanding. Uh, rights, basically, basic rights. It's it's the, the clarion call is a very feminist message, um, women, life, freedom. What makes it extraordinary is that this is the first time, not only in Iran, 
but around the world where we're seeing a movement that is that has a revolutionary feel to it, but um, where women aren't just leading uh, the effort, but the message is a feminist message. We've had women lead in Sudan. We've had women lead in Yemen and even in Egypt in 2012. Women were at the forefront of, of a lot of these push of these movements for democracy. But the message wasn't, the, the uniting message wasn't one that was situated around women's rights. This time in Iran, this is what it is. It's a culmination of three generations, as I said, of, of women fighting for their rights across the board. And again, what makes it unique is that it has unified people or inspired people across gender. We have men standing together with women. That's never happened before. Class, geography, sect, uh, ethnicity, et cetera. It's, it's all around, it's been all around the country and it's among young children. So when you have your 12 year olds and your 13 year olds basically demonstrating um, opposition, if you want, in one way or another to the ruling um, regime, it's very hard to change that mindset. And the regime's attitude of course has been to crack down heavily and to sow fear and, and, and do all these things. But I don't think that you're gonna, I, I don't think this shift in mindset and this openness and this, this this, as I say, this message of women, life, freedom, and all that it brings with it is, is going away. I, th I think it's there to, to continue to um, spread and hopefully nonviolently, um, uh, which, is, which is the way most women-led movements are. Thank you. Father Michael, how would you characterize the crisis in Iran? Well, I think it has very deep roots. Uh, and there is a culture of repression that uh, since, the, since the revolution itself, and indeed, uh, before the, before then, civil society is weak. Uh, I mean, I do understand what is being said about these demonstrations, but civil society organizations are weak and have been weakened. Um, what um, worries me uh, most of all about this crisis, and indeed past crises that have that have also occurred is that there is a kind of political, military, uh, market um, tie-up in Iran, which conspires against uh, greater freedom for people, whether these are uh, minorities uh, or freedom for women or indeed freedom for citizens in Iran uh, generally. And how to shift that, I think, is the challenge because the revolutionary movement, uh, having confiscated uh, many of the assets of the Shah and of, of Western powers, uh, have invested these in the bazaar. Uh, so there is an interest in the market itself to perpetuate uh, what is going on. And of course, the political, the religio-political establishment is, is heavily involved. So of course, it's wonderful to see these brave people out in the streets, uh, risking their lives, sometimes losing their lives. But the political agenda will only shift if the market decides it's no longer economic for it um, to be allied to these people. And if the armed forces decide that they can no longer brutally suppress their own people. Thank you, Marjan. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I would um, add to what um, the panelists have said already and um, uh, characterize the crisis or the moment in Iran as one of uh, both evolution and revolution. Uh, a moment where um, the frustrations of the past 40 years and the efforts to repair and restore um, uh, um, the elements of freedom and dignity in Iran um, have transformed into a moment of revolution um, where people are trying to take matters in their own hands and fight with everything that they have got to um, obtain liberty and freedom and dignity. Um, the three words of woman, life, freedom, really capture the essence of what they are looking for. And unlike the past 40 years, um, they are realizing that um, there is no more legitimacy 
and possibility of um, working with the current regime. Um, and therefore they're trying to take matters uh, in their own hands through the Revolutionary Act by uh, participating um, in a numerous array of acts of dis civil disobedience of which street protest is only one. And um, we can talk about what are some of the other ways of um, this revolutionary expressions, but they are telling the world that this regime is no longer a legitimate regime for them and they want to overthrow it. And then regionally, they are fighting with an atmosphere where um, foreign governments are at a loss and in a state of confusion as to whether they should recognize the Islamic Republic as a legitimate entity or whether they should honor the will of the Iranian people and encourage them to um, nominate and elect their own leaders um, to be as representatives of the future Iran. That's a very uh, stark difference between the two and obviously very much, very much in play. Uh, Professor Mogadam, you're on mute at the moment. There you go. Um, can you tell us what, how you would define the crisis? Um, I'm a psychologist and I would place this uh, current Iranian situation in two contexts. One is uh, the process of uh, change, psychological change from more dictatorial to less dictatorial. Um, I don't believe we have any fully developed democracies, but some societies have made more progress towards democracy. So that's one context. Uh, the second context is the transition uh, when, when um, there are anti-dictatorship revolutions. And I've been studying these, and in most cases, anti-dictatorship revolutions simply transform one dictatorship to another form of dictatorship. Uh, there are very few successful revolutions in history. Um, I don't include the American Revolution, which I regard as a rebellion against an external force. So uh, from my perspective, the way to understand Iran better and the women life freedom movement better is to really place these in historical context in terms of the psychological changes taking place and the changes that are necessary in order to move towards a more open democratic society. And unfortunately, in the Iranian case, what we had was transition from one form of dictatorship to another, which is the classic case. The French, uh, the Russian, the Chinese, the Cuban, all these revolutions simply transformed one kind of dictatorship to another. And so we have to keep in mind the historical context of changes and the very great challenge of psychological changes necessary in order to move towards democracy. And the phrase I would introduce here is political plasticity. How difficult it is to move uh, in political behavior in different areas. I'll give you an example, leadership. Why is leadership so difficult to change? For example, in the United States, we still are not near having a female in the White House. So it's not just Iran, it's a global situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, speaking of that, we were maybe a bit uh, exaggerated in our title for this forum when we said, we asked, can Iran recover its democracy? I think uh, perhaps I should ask, is there a democratic moment in the past? Is there a, is there a time that the Iranian people can feel nostalgic about, even if the current citizens have not lived through that moment. I mean, I, I know people who like to characterize the Shah's time as one of great enlightenment. And uh, I suppose if you were in the right social class and and uh, had the right friends, maybe maybe you could practice a life of enlightenment at that time, but it was not by any definition, democracy. So is there a moment, Sanam, is there is there a moment in history that you would look back to? Uh, a couple of things on that. Um, I think if I think it's been a democracy in in attempt, let's put it that way. We have the 1906 constitutional 
revolution that was trying to sort of limit the power of of the of the dynasty, you know, the the king at the time, and and bring parliamentary constitutional uh, rule. We had, of course, 1953 with Mossadegh and 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 the attempts at you know nationalization of oil, and again, kind of limit the the power of of the monarchy. Um, and then bringing it to the Shah's time, um, I was 11 when when the revolution actually took place, and I was definitely um, in a within a you know growing up in a social class that was supposedly of that extreme privilege that you're talking about. Uh, what I found extraordinary was that um, we were largely brought up with the principle that, uh, in Persian expression, that uh, the walls have mice and the mice have ears. Divar mushdara mushkushdara, which means there was very little political talk. Um, I, I and and I can tell you for in our in our uh, school books, for example, we celebrated the nationalization of oil. That was marked. That was a national holiday. But I hadn't heard the name Mossadegh until I arrived in England in 1979, and, and he's he's I'm related to the man. Um, so so there, you know, the idea that during the Shah's time there was some you know notion of open speech and so forth is 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 a bit of a fallacy. I do remember just at the time of the revolution, sort of in the fall of '78, when the press was given more freedom and political prisoners were released. Um, that there were reports in the newspaper, and I remember my mother reading to us the accounts of people being having been tortured in prison and so forth. So there was a sort of window, I think, uh, in the seventy, you know, September of seventy eight, maybe through to the end of seventy nine, that there was some opening again, but then it got immediately um, shut down, and and so many people were executed in those early uh, years and months of the of the coming of the Islamists. Um, so many political opposition groups uh, and member and people who returned to Iran thinking that they were going to have a space then ended up back in prison, including again one of my my aunts who was a member of the Socialist Tudeh Party. He came, she came back from Eastern Germany and ended up being um, the oldest female political prisoner in the world um, under under the current regime. So, um, so yeah. So there are these moments of opening and awakening, and and then and then very as as uh, as uh, Ali says, uh, dictatorship begets dictatorship, and and we shouldn't assume that the current change doesn't also lead us. You know, we could end up becoming like Egypt, where you have a military dictatorship um, with the guise of a of a of a suit. Um, uh, it, it, it's very hard to move towards democracy, um, avoiding violence. And, and that's, that's my work. It's like, how do you do it? How do you do a South Africa? How do you do a Tunisia? Um, uh, there are lots of other exits that are, that are much more dangerous and we have to consider them. Anyone have any other thoughts about democracy? I'd like, uh, Marjan? Yeah, I, I, what I wanted to add is that, yes, we do have, um, uh, moments in history where certain, um, elements of uh, freedom and democracy or hopes were ignited. And even, even if things did not um, materialize at the moment into what um, the people had aspired for, there is at least memory of those. But there's also a Persian proverb um, that says, Adab as as biadaban. Who did you learn your manners from? From the root people. And yes, maybe Iranian people have not succeeded at achieving um, what they wanted through examples of success in the past. Nonetheless, they're very observant. We have to realize that over 90% of the population in Iran is literate. Over 70% of the population in Iran has connectivity. And they are paying attention to what is happening around the world. And they have been harmed enough and hurt enough um, and yet aspired enough to look and at, look at what is happening around the world throughout the history and also continue with their aspirations. So they are looking at those failures of revolutions and failures of, of movements of the past. And I really believe that they are, um, they're going to make history by, by showing a new way. Just this movement that we are talking about, as Sanam said, it is, exemplary in and of itself. And I think that Iranian people will make history by, um, by learning from the collective successes, but also the collective failures of history. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, Ali. Um, I'd like to make just three points. One is that 
Uh, I went back with the revolution and uh, initially in 79, we did have freedom. I was teaching in universities in the spring of revolution and uh, we were very free for about five or six months before, wow. you know, the hostage taking and all that took over. Uh, the second point is that um, uh, when you study revolutions, it's much easier to overthrow a regime than to set up a democracy after. Of course. That, 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 that's very easy. Um, uh, third point is I, I agree with um, Marjan that, that uh, we have to be uh, optimistic in, in, in recognizing that this woman life freedom movement is very progressive and constructive and they're learning from others. Uh, but theoretical learning is different from the psychological skills needed to implement a democracy. And that's of in mind. Yes. Of course. Father Michael, um, what about the taking a, a step back, the role of women in Iran overall? The, some of our panelists have spoken quite eloquently of their leadership in the current moment. But... Uh, this all began with focus on the morality police and the hijab regulations and so on. Um, but are there larger points we made about the role of women and is some change in that necessary before Iran can really move forward at all? Yes, thank you. Uh, before I come to that, I mean, there are uh, examples of successful revolutions. Some have been mentioned already by Sanan, but uh, for example, the, the disappearance of the Iron Curtain. I mean, so many countries were freed to some extent and democracy introduced uh, in our own lifetime, certainly in my lifetime. Um, so it can be done. Um, and also, uh, we shouldn't look for sort of absolute outcomes. You know, there can be relative outcomes where there is some freedom, but not everything that we need, at least in the intermediate uh, period. Um, may I tell you a story? Please. Um, I was in Tehran at the same time that the cylinder of Cyrus, you know, the great decree by the Emperor Cyrus uh, of freedom for his subjects throughout the Persian Empire had been loaned by the British Museum to the National Museum in Tehran. And I was uh, in a dialogue with uh, some people uh, from the um, Foundation for Culture and uh, Islamic Relations uh, there. And I thought I would open uh, what I had to say uh, by noting that the Cylinder of Cyrus was in Tehran as I spoke. And the person opposite who was chairing the meeting, who was the vice chairman of that organization, the Sazimani Farhan, I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, he said to me, he said, we are not interested in the past. We are only interested in the future. And I thought that was a very strange kind of comment mm. to make um, because there has been this aspiration for freedom among the uh, people of Iran. Um, even the Greek uh, historians note that um, whilst there were empires and the kind of almost godlike status of the of the Shah and Shah, uh, the, so the concept of fare izadi. Nevertheless, that in local communities, there was a kind of uh, democracy that operated. Um, some of the aspirations and the movements that arose have been mentioned already. One, of course, was the resistance to the tobacco concessions. Uh, which was actually led to a great extent by the religious leaders who um, uh, were uh, for popular participation at that time. So that it's not impossible. Uh, and um, certainly the, the 1906 settlement was a hopeful one, which gave some role uh, to the religious leaders, but in the context of a democratic order. It, could have worked uh, if uh, the First World War and the disorder that it caused had not overtaken and the coup d'etat of, of Raza Shah had not happened. 
So um, there have been episodes, and uh, yes, I think the uh, uh, the freedom that uh, Professor Mukaddam uh, experienced uh, did last uh, for some time. However, by the time the Iran-Iraq war broke out, it had completely ended. Uh, I was in Iran at that time, and it was the most tragic uh, place to be in because a whole generation was sacrificed uh, during that war in, in a way that was almost casual. Uh, women, um, I mean, it's a paradox, I think, the situation of women in Iran, because it's not like Afghanistan, for example. I mean, uh, you know, women are still in the professions, uh, a very large number, perhaps a majority, or women in the universities, um, they can hold and do hold political office. Uh, many of the spokespeople for the regime are women. I mean, you know, so um, we have to understand that. And I mean, the point about literacy and so on has been made. Tertiary education, at least in some spheres, is open to women, but not all. That that is a question that has to be addressed. Um, and um, there has been, I mean, until now, I don't know what will happen now, but in the cities like Tehran or Isfahan uh, or Shiraz, there was a kind of a turning of, of the blind eye to, what, to how women were expressing themselves in, in public. Uh, I'm not sure what this, if there is a crackdown, what that will result in. Um, Foreign women that I've been with in Iran have felt the oppression more than I have, and I think they are better judges of that. Um, so uh, I have taken how they have felt very seriously uh, as a signal of how Irani women must feel. How, how do we explain the brutality of the crackdown against these protests, um, perhaps it's just a resistance to change. Perhaps it's just an established elite not wanting to give up power. But it seems, at least while it was very much in the news until recently, it seemed like an extreme level of brutality and death sentences and children being arrested and so on. Ali. Uh, after the Second World War, psychologists did a lot of research on the kinds of people who supported Hitler. And if you look at that research, it's very relevant to the kinds of people who support harmony at the moment. These are highly authoritarian, dogmatic men, mostly men, low in education. They are very, very threatened by women competent women, highly educated women. So we can tell psychologically who is going to support this regime and the kinds of policies that these people want. And one of the policies they want is high aggression against dissimilar others, particularly women. Sana. Just to add to that, um... I think we see a variety of things. Number one, the regime has always been pretty brutal, but we also have a culture in Iran of, of historically thinking about sort of the domestic sphere and the public sphere, and, and, and we call it Andaruni and Biruni. And in many ways, you could argue that, that a lot of the violence was maintained in that Andaruni and that domestic, it was hidden, and we didn't necessarily see it. And and I, I'm interested in, in what Ali says about the psychology, because I think we're also a culture that doesn't like to display victimhood. And therefore, we don't actually talk about the violence and the trauma and what's been done to us and, and, and so forth. There's, there's a lot of pride in kind of not bringing that out. Um, so it, in many ways, the last 40 years, we haven't really heard um, a, a lot of what has happened to people. That That's one thing. This time around, we saw it in the street. And as Ali says, it, it's... There's a visceral, it's almost like watching um, the incel movement, you know, the involuntary celibate kind of movement in terms of how viciously they were attacking women when you see them, you know, literally beating people up and, and so forth. I think it's also related to the existential fear 
because when you think that the re- you know if this is really a revolution that's going to bring down the system and you as a man are part of that system and not only you're part of the system uh, the stick in your hand is tied to the bread on your table and you're feeding mm-hmm. six seven other people the existential fear of what's going to happen to me i think i think drives drives all of that and then uh, one last point we mustn't forget the women that are part of the system as well and and this revolution you know back in 1977 78 when they started mobilizing they mobilized and recruited women like many extremist movements do they they understand they understood the power and influence of women so they've coerced and co-opted it for themselves and women often join these types of movements or systems to have adjacency to power and so they they are integral to to these things as well and so um and, and then finally i mean it it's the more threatened they feel, the more heavily they will crack down and sow fear as a way of trying to sort of push people back. We see a pattern. Every time there's a public protest over the last 30 years, it's been heavy crackdown, a little bit of back down, heavy crackdown, a little. So this is, I think, the same pattern. It'll be interesting to see what, uh, when things calm down, really what happens in terms of women's expression in public and and the and the and the girls in, uh, who are going out in the street without completely without hijab now what happens right now they're putting it around their scarf the scarf around their necks and show you know they they have it so if they need to put it up they'll they'll put it up but it'll be interesting to see really what what the regime's game is going to be and how they how they um uh literally scare what scare tactics they're going to use um against women moving forward but we see the crackdown and and back down kind of as as a as as part of their strategy of releasing the pressure but maintaining control i, I want to move on in just a moment to iran's geopolitical role but stay for a moment with the cultural questions um uh, Michael, did you have something you wanted to add now and then i'll uh, i i want to talk about for a moment a book that was very well-known and celebrated some years ago called Reading Lolita in Tehran, which described a sort of furtive <laughs> cultural flowering in some in some respect, that as long as nobody noticed, people could, could uh, exercise intellectual curiosity. And I, I but let, let's, uh, Marjan, do you have anything to say about that? You know, I think that, um... Iran is not Afghanistan, but Iran is uh, ruining the Taliban. And we are seeing elements of the current regime's behavior that in some ways are mocking and um, emulating uh, the the Taliban's attitude toward women. Look at what they're doing in the schools um, with poisoning of the schoolgirls. they are, you know, yes, we have had a generation of educated um, and intellectual strong women um, that probably is a result of, you know, what, what was created before. And, you know, the minister of education in Iran was a woman uh, during the Shah. And um, her work was based on providing an equal level of education between men and women, of regarding women as equals, it was fundamentally about men and women being equal, which, and and that fundamental element of democracy was eliminated as soon as the Islamic Republic came into power. It was one of Khomeini's first promises and and beliefs that men and women are not equal. Women, men and women should not have the same level of education. And so, um, whatever we have had in terms of the strong educated women, um, m- majority of college graduates of today, doesn't mean that it's going to continue in the same fashion should the Islamic Republic remain in power in the next 40 years. Because of how they're, how they're assaulting um, girls who are seeking an education in the, in the, as, as young as elementary school age, um, and because of other rules and um, method and, and, and cultural changes that they're inculcating into the society, like child marriage, like forced marriage, like um, the um, encourage, uh, uh, encouragement of um, temporary marriages and um, and a questioning of rape, blaming rape on women, um, and br- blaming. Um, all kinds of other um, societal ills 
on women's desire to have freedom. So um, yes, we ha women have been exemplary and successful in Iran, but should th th we have to recognize that the Iranian regime is trying to change that through step-by-step um, -step cultural changes and assaults on women and girls, including the poisoning of the girls and including um, the um, societal norms um, such as child marriage and, and uh, forced marriage. Sounds horrifying. Really I does. think there is, um, um, Sandy, there is a, a fundamental tension in Iran uh, between culture and ideology. Mm -hmm. So uh, the culture runs much more deeply than the ideology, obviously, for most people, if not for everyone. Um, I mean, just to tell you another story, I had a, I was in a delegation uh, for a dialogue with Shia clerics in the holy city of Qom. And after that, they gave me a gift and I didn't open the gift. I, I, I thought I would go to my hotel room and then open it. When I opened it, it was a fully illustrated, published in Iran, fully illustrated copy of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. And I thought to myself, why uh, are these clerics giving a Christian bishop uh, such an explicitly illustrated copy of um, these uh, sensual poems? And uh, the answer is that it was, they thought it was uh, an example of culture. At least that is what I thought was the reason. I, I hope I'm right. Um, and you know, you go into a bookshop, uh, certainly in the big cities, and uh, the Iranian poets are on sale, uh, mm -hmm. um, Sufi poets are on sale. Uh, there's quite a lot of, you know, um, I found translations of uh, the works of St. Augustine and of Thomas Aquinas on sale uh, in Iran. So, uh, there is this fundamental tension between culture and ideology, and I hope that this revolution, this crisis that is going on, will show us that it is the culture, the deeply embedded culture of the Iranian people that will triumph. We're going to move in a short time to Mike Scott and the questions that have come in. I see there are quite a few, but I, I want to raise first this issue of the geopolitical role of Iran at the moment. Um, I think most people see the mullah's support of Russia in Ukraine, very active, unabashed support of the Russian attack on Ukraine, as particularly cynical. Um, in Syria, um, I don't know whether the role has been constructive in any respect or not, perhaps in some, but they they seem to be uh, gambling their prestige and their influence on some fairly dodgy causes, don't you think, Senna? Well, yeah. I right. I would I would take it back um, uh, just one step in terms of the geopolitics because I think that what we see is. Um, the Iranians, you know, since 9-11 have basically the regime, basically it's been a uh, essentially protect and survive, you know, they're, 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 they're about themselves. So back in 2003, you know, they helped the U.S. actually get rid of the Taliban originally, that, that we have documented evidence mm -hmm. um, from American officials. They offered, uh, you know, 2003, they said, we'll help you with Saddam, and, and they got the axis of evil in response. And so, so you know, since then, basically, they, what they did was they said, you know, if America is going to come into our neighborhood, we will go back into the neighborhood. We're going to protect our own boundaries and so forth. And I think that's been the general rule, you know, that they'll create chaos in, in Iraq. They'll do what they have to do uh, in the region. Um, with Syria, I think it's more. It was more about the fact that the Syrian re regime had helped Iran during the Iran-Iraq War, so it was more, more kind of a payback. But what I find interesting right now is that as this women life freedom movement was happening, um, the Saudis played a brilliant game because what they did was since 2016, when the JCPOA was signed, and they didn't like it particularly, 
they've been using media, Iran International and, and Manitou Television and others, to blast a lot of criticism and a lot of nostalgia about the Shah's time and so forth, and, and you know, sort of create a different psychology at the public level. Um, with the rise of the with, with the rise of the women life freedom movement, again, Iran International has been pivotal, but it's owned by the Saudis. And meanwhile, Saudis have been negotiating with the Iranians. And the reason why I think this is happening is that Iran, Saudi Arabia, and and is uh, sorry, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Israel um, actually it would not be to their benefit if Iran emerged as a viable, legitimate democracy, especially a women led or feminist kind of. Uh, signifier of, of a democracy, because the minute you have that, you would be challenging what the Saudis are doing with Wahhabism, what the Israelis are doing with the Palestinians, the autocracies around the region. So I don't think that they, I think that the strategy was always to weaken the regime and then make a deal with them, which is exactly what they've done now. So, so we're seeing an alignment of autocracies essentially in that region. And that's, and it's kind of coming in line with the, with the rise of autocracies, you know, the Russians and, and others. And the demise of Western, you know, the U.S. and and the West in that region and and elsewhere, but um, and coming back to the point about the Taliban is that by, you know, what we the way we negotiated the failure of the negotiations with the Taliban and the way the U.S. and NATO withdrew from Afghanistan and handed the country back to the Taliban, we're just mm -hmm. beginning to see the effects of that in the region and around the world, and it is a nasty, nasty. Um, very insidious sort of state that that is that is emerging and all, but the countries in the region are playing their own game to figure it out but it, it's um uh, iran will I, I think the regime will do whatever it takes to survive that's they don't you know for themselves to survive I'm, i don't think they necessarily care that much about the public or the well-being of the public they'll do enough for them to to be to be calmed down but or or to be suppressed but i i i think that um that whatever they're doing in the region, it's it's you have to look at it in terms of their own survival. Anyone have thoughts about their role in Ukraine? Well, not to Ukraine, Sandy, but I mean just to continue from where Sanam has uh, ended. Um, the West's presence in the region uh, is not virtuous. Uh, I mean that that should be clear. <laughs> uh, we shouldn't assume in any way that it is. Uh, if you think of the support that they've given uh, the Saudi Arabian uh, regime over so many years as a close ally, uh, thereby allowing it to repress its yeah. own populations. Uh, but in Syria, for instance, uh, that was mentioned, um, the West is supporting the very movements that it was opposing in Afghanistan, uh, in Syria. And uh, an incidental result, actually, of Iranian and Russian involvement in Syria has been uh, to allow uh, the kind of um, significant minority uh, presence in Syria, whether it's Christian or Alawite uh, or Druze, uh, to survive. Because uh, if the Assad regime had fallen to the Sunni extremists, we would have another kind of Afghanistan in Syria uh, with no future for the minorities whatsoever. Uh, I think the reason why Iran is in Syria has to do with uh, its, uh, its attitude to Israel uh, in the end. But an incidental result has been that the minorities uh, in Syria have survived for the time being against a vicious kind of Sunni extremism. Uh, such as we see in Afghanistan. But the West's withdrawal from Afghanistan in the way that it happened has signaled that it cannot be trusted, uh, that it will leave people to their own. I remember talking to the Pakistani foreign minister about the so-called double face that Pakistan was presenting vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Taliban. And he said to me, he said, look, he said, the." Um, the Americans are going to cut and run. We have to live with these guys. What do you think we should do? Mm. So I think all of that has to be taken into account. Sure. I, I think uh, there, I see there are quite a few questions that have come in. So let's go to mm -hmm. Michael Scott and uh, continue this conversation, but in the context of the questions from participants on the outside. Michael. Well, thanks very much for uh, for the discussion. It's um, I have to say, just listening listening to it, 
it, it's it's been a little dis well not disappointing <laughs> disheartening because it's been a good discussion but a disheartening because where do we find where do we find uh, solutions to this and it, and it just struck me and I want to go to Ali Magadan first really uh, with a question for me first which is this is all to do with tyranny um, it seems. And we've got tyranny in the world. We've got tyranny elsewhere. We've got those problems with, with, uh, with, with Russia. What's the psychology here, uh, Ali, in terms of uh, a tyranny? And, and, and where in your experience uh, of your reading in psychology, where can you, can you find some kind of positivity about getting rid of the, the, the tyrant? Uh, well, we have to be realistic, and uh, countries all began as dictatorships, and some have made some progress towards democracy. In order to develop democratic citizens, we have to have mass education that will enrich democratic citizenship. At the moment, we have elite education that does that in some countries, but not mass education. So the, the bright side is that we have the know-how and the technology to bring about mass education for democracy. And the challenge is to get the political leadership and the political elite to see this as a priority and to, to engage in changing democratic citizenship. That is the long-term optimistic goal. Um, so I am optimistic, but I, I tend to be a long-term thinker rather than short-term. And um, I, I agree with uh, a lot that has been said, particularly about the distinction between ideology and culture. And that is an important point to keep in mind, uh, but also that in order to have a democracy, we need democratic citizens, citizens with the psychological skills and tools to participate in a democracy en masse. So we need education for that. So I'm optimistic in that sense. Well, thanks for that. Can I go to a question from Kyle Marson? He said, uh, it, it takes this on really. Uh, where do the panelists see pro-democracy leadership emerging from? And what role can the Iranian diaspora play? Who is capable of taming the IRGC? Mm -hmm. Sanam, do you want to try that? Um, where is democratic leadership coming from? Um, I think that uh, if you look at the young people and especially the women in Iran, um, you will see profound democratic leadership. And, and, and feminist movements generally around the world right now are one of our most important hopes and most targeted um, sectors because of because of this idea of, of these issues. But they are there. We have amazing women leaders. They are in jail, but they remain inspiring, and and people know them. And so, so that I think is where where it's at. In terms of the diaspora's role, um, I think that there are two things. One is that the diaspora. We we have different diaspora. We have people who've been here forty years. We have people who have just arrived. And what Ali's saying about the democratic mindset is actually really important in the context of the diaspora, because what I worry about is that if you have grown up within a system that is a particular mindset um, the, of the regime, you bring that mindset out. You know, if, if the regime tells you that anybody who works with a media or the government is affiliated with the government or is a spy, you bring that mindset out. And then you come into a world where you have freedom of expression and you have that mindset and freedom of expression, and you basically are saying whatever you want. That's not democracy. That democracy is actually respecting each other's human rights as well, and respecting freedom of speech. And um, living in a democratic society means dealing with nuance, dealing with compromise, dealing with people you don't like, and not assuming that just because you don't like them, they need to be canceled and shut down and killed. Um, and unfortunately, we have a lot of this stuff coming out into the diaspora, and I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done with the diaspora communities that we that, that we have. The other thing which I think is fascinating is that I, I also work with a lot of people who come out of a you know, dictatorship and or live in uh, dictatorial settings, 
you know, when you live in a dictatorship, you have no rights, but you also don't have any responsibilities. You don't have civic response. If there's trash in the street, it's the government's fault. If, if there's, you know, environmental problems, it's the government's fault. So I think one of the things that is, is actually really interesting about Iran that the Khatami period tried to do was to foster civic engagement and, and activity. So, so we don't, we may not have very big, loud civil, civil society organizations, and they certainly shut down the ones that become powerful. But this idea of ordinary people picking up themes and deciding for themselves to be engaged, whether it's in, as I say, trash collection, environment, uh, you know, whatever, these are all part of that idea of um, democratic mindset of having self-empowerment, enablement, and, and pushing and, and, and wanting to have change and saying we have a role. So these are also part of the positive things that, that I think um, we're seeing there. But, but again, as going back to what uh, Marjan was saying, the early warning signs of how they're going after girls' schools and how they're shutting down. These are it's it's still early, you know. It but we have to watch how they do this. And and I'll end with one thing: sanctions are really really bad because when you impoverish people, they do end up going off and marrying their daughters at a young age, especially the very poor. And and it and when you don't have other income, you do go and work for the state and so forth. So we have to be careful about whether from the outside world. Um, the sanctions and the economic pressure we're putting on is on the regime or on the people. And at the moment, to me, the regime has actually become strengthened um, with, with uh, years of sanctions that, that we've had. Michael, I, I saw you nodding and uh, looking serious on that. But do you want to come back on that? Yes. No, uh, I mean, I agree with quite a lot of what's been said, but um, there is a tradition uh, within the ulama, within the religious leaders in Iran, of thinking about democracy and promoting democracy. I'm thinking of people who are very senior. I mean, Ayatollah Montazari, for instance, was at one time deputy supreme leader. Uh, and he had a clear vision of how uh, a Shia Islam could relate to a democratic order. Uh, and for that reason, uh, because he uh, voiced uh, these ideas, he was demoted and imprisoned and so on. But uh, there are followers of his around still. Um, uh, Ayatollah Tehrani, who has campaigned for greater religious freedom, uh, is another uh, figure, even for the Baha'i people. Uh, the Hausa Ilmiya in, uh, in Qom, uh, uh, has a very fine library and has been a place where uh, ideas about democracy and uh, a bill of rights, for instance, that's not been mentioned in our discussion, but very important in a populist uh, situation that we don't just leave it to popular will, but to safeguard through a bill of rights, uh, fundamental freedoms. Uh, I mean, all of that is discussed, Mufid University in Qom is another place where these discussions are taking place. So I think where we can engage with these currents of thought, we should uh, do so. Um, but also to empower ordinary people. Um, I mean, connectivity was mentioned, I think, by Marjan, and that's right. But uh, access to information and getting information out is crucial, I think, in this context so that uh, uh, the world comes to know what actually is going on and people in Iran understand how the world is standing with them. Um, I think all these uh, aspects um, can lead to, uh, to real change. But in the end, I think it will be the realization by the armed forces in Iran and by the Iranian market, that they cannot continue to support a regime that represses its own people. Marjan, do you want to comment on that? I just wanted to say a couple of things, if you don't mind. Number one, um, to, to associate child marriage with sanctions um, is really a misrepresentation of reality. Um, when there are every year, every few years, they are actually, the Iranian regime is literally changing its own laws about and lowering the age officially for marriage. Uh, it has nothing to do with sanctions. They are making a deliberate choice to sexualize children, boys and girls, and to encourage that. They are not making any changes to religious um, writings about 
um, about sexual abuse of children. None whatsoever, independent of sanctions and economic um, um, depravities of the country. Not also, we cannot talk about sanctions affecting the Iranian uh, majority of the Iranian population without talking about the Iranian government itself mismanagement, mismanaging um, its economy and the kleptocracy that has been prevalent in the country for the past 40 some years. The, ex the sending of the finances and resources of the country abroad. I mean, you cannot blame sanctions independently without blaming Iran's own mismanagement of its finances. And then related to that probably, um, because you also mentioned Israel as um, a country that would not want Iran to be um, a free democracy. Um, Israel, Israel is the only democracy in the region. However imperfect, it is the only democracy in the region, which even has members of the minority participating in its government. We saw in, uh, you know, if you criticize what is happening with Bibi Netanyahu, but we saw last year, you know, members of the um, Muslim population, the Palestinians having a role in the government itself. And, um, and especially because Iran is the number one existential threat to Israel, I don't think there is any country that would love to see a democracy in Iran flourish more than, more than the state of Israel. Um, I also have thoughts on um, diaspora, role of the diaspora and, and leadership, um, if, if I may. Yes, please. Uh, so going to the question of um, who is going to lead a future Iran, I think we have seen as, as the co-panelists have um, referenced, yes, there is a, such an environment of repression that any emerging charismatic leader, even anyone with a pen, including the two women who broke the story of Mahsa and Mini are, are, are still in jail. So any form of new thought and ideology and leadership and, and, and aspiration for future when it's expressed is at risk. The moment it is expressed, it is at risk of suppression. And because of that, the opposition movement inside Iran has evolved to uh, focus its attention, not on the individuals, but uh, on the ideologies, exactly you know, what, what was referenced, the theme in this conversation. They are supporting ideologies, not individuals. And the ideology that they go back to time and again in every version of a charter that has been created since the beginning of the Mahsa revolution represents a, 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 a solid and un, uh, unchanging um, uh, support and belief in democracy, in a secular democracy. And that's what people want. And that should be the role of any diaspora and any allies, Iranian or non-Iranians, who want to support the people of Iran, to support a free and democratic secular Iran. Thank you for that. Susan Wolf has, uh, talks, uh, talks about the regime is so dangerous, so suppressive. Uh, to the women of Iran in particular, and the, the women are so courageous, but they're also incredibly vulnerable to the regime, to the violence, the poisonings, the shootings of children and so on. And she asks, how can the West support them more? Now, a little earlier on in the discussion, because we, we did point to the, to the fact that the West's um, reputation is not so good in all of this, is it? You know. So how, how do we find in the West some kind of means to have an influence when it, all, all the time people, tyrants, can point and say, but look what you did. How do we do that? Michael, you're nodding. Yeah, I think providing greater connectivity in all sorts of ways so people's voices are heard outside Iran and they know that the world is also engaged and listening. Uh, I think that does have an effect uh, on things like brutality, uh, on repression, on sort of uh, egregious kinds of um, 
uh, elements of uh, what the regime is doing. Uh, the, um, the other um, way is to uh, give more attention to the United Nations and its um, mm -hmm. instruments. So we have not at all mentioned the, the work of the UN Rapporteur on Iran. His report at the five yearly review uh, of the uh, United Nations Human Rights Committee was devastating. I mean, I've got it in front of me just now uh, of what is happening. And the, uh, the response of the regime is, is feeble in the extreme. I, I've got that in front of me as well. Um, I think uh, uh, that kind of forum has, has to be used more. Uh, reporting on the situation uh, by providing greater access to information uh, from Iran and to Iran would also, uh, could also help. Um, regional um, pressure um, can assist. I mean, I, I know that um, what is happening at the moment in the kind of rapprochement between the Gulf powers and Iran has a dark side to it, undoubtedly. Um, but ending Iran's isolation um, uh, can be a good thing if people get to hear more of what is going on inside the country. Yes, please, Sanat. Yeah. Just, just, uh, just on a couple of points. Um, so, what we, you know, we did research in Iraq um, in terms of the impact of sanctions and how it, how, what the gender dimensions of impact of sanctions are, um, and the the correlation with poverty and people in extreme in areas of extreme poverty and how they end up giving up their girls for early marriage is there. We have that evidence. We did a study in 2012 when when the first when the sanctions the the heavy financial sanctions were being imposed on Iran with women in Iran and they were raising these issues. So I don't think it's either or. I think the regime, as as Marjan says, has a strategy and has its own ideology and it's and it's a very insidious ideology. And at the same time, these blanket sanctions end up having a huge impact on the economics of of the the wider populace and force people into very dangerous um, activities and and often women are at the at the uh, at, you know are, are the most affected so I think that I think that that's that's one thing to to bear in mind the second thing is um on the question of uh democracy within Shiism which is true I, th I think I think there's a lot of very interesting discourse and debate in that space that said, one of the challenges that we've had, and I've, and when when we've had um, Iranian Islamist scholars come to Washington and Georgetown speaking and so forth, I've raised this with them, is that you know saying that you have pluralism and, and we're willing to deal with people from different sects or religions and different communities is one thing. Ask them about giving women equal rights, and there's suddenly a. I mean, literally, I've been told things like, "Well, if the women don't like it, they can leave." We have a problem in Iran with, with the constitution being Sharia law and that Sharia law being interpreted in a way that I am not an equal citizen like Ali is. When I go to court, I am half, I represent half the witness value that he has. So until and unless Shiism is willing to deal with us as you know, women as equal human beings, um, the, the, there is a huge challenge um, in terms of, especially with, with the way that Sharia law is being interpreted in Iran right now. And, and you can't have democracy if half your population are fundamentally not equal. We have Jewish representatives in parliament. We've always had them from before. Uh, we've had, we, we have, you know, very, apart from the Baha'is, I think, I think other minority groups actually do have uh, 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 political representation in the Iranian parliament. But, um, but, you know, when you think about it in terms of basic fundamental rights, we are not equal on, in, within the current um, uh, legal framework uh, in, in Iran. So, so that, that needs to be dealt with by, by Shiism or hopefully by secular democracy, as Marjan was saying, which is basically the, where we would all like to end up. Yeah, I mean, I think there, are, uh, there has always been in Shia, among the Shia ulama, a, a, a more traditional approach to the Sharia and another approach uh, which could result in, uh, in an interpretation of Sharia that leads to a recognition of equality, uh, not just for women, but I mean, we can't reduce this whole thing to be about women or about minorities or any particular group. I mean, it, 
we have to talk across the board. And um, the situation of the Baha'i community, men and women and children, is, is terrible. I mean, it, it really is. And indeed, of the many converts to Christianity from Shia Islam uh, that now exist in Iran who have no legal status whatsoever. Uh, the, um, I mean, I think to, I may be wrong, I hope I'm wrong about this, but I think the initial step in Iran will be of a democracy that takes Shia Islam into account. I can't see a straight jump to a secular polity just like that, unless something very radical happens. Uh, but this has happened in the past. The 1906 constitution was mentioned that envisaged a role for the ulama, although an advisory one in the constitutional uh, arrangements. Uh, that also was the case under the Shah. And Muntazari, in his vision for democracy, also saw an advisory uh, role uh, rather than a role with formal power uh, for the ulama. I suspect that is what will happen in the first instance anyway, in any kind of transition, if it's an orderly transition. Um, but there has been a lot of creative thinking about, uh, about Sharia, both in Sunni Islam, particularly in Sunni Islam, but also among Lebanese Shia, people like Mahmoud Ayyub, uh, which can be used um, to uh, persuade people that inequality is not a necessary um, um, corollary of um, respect for Sharia. Thank you. Marjan, I think you were saying you wanted to speak. Uh, yes, I just wanted to indicate something. Um, and while there is definitely a strong um, religious um, roots in Iran, both on the Shia and, is, uh, and, and Sunni um, levels in Iran. Um, there's also a very um, significant movement of turning away from religion that is taking place in Iran. And um, including uh, you know, very respected Ayatollahs who were so disenchanted by the abuse of religion um, in, in the, in the, by the regime that they have actually decided that they will take off the garb in a ceremonious way and they would, they would do away with the, with the, with, with, um, the presentation of, um, uh, uh, with the, with the of office of the clergy because they have been so turned away. Um, you know, some of the more progressive Ayatollahs um, have been mentioned, like Ayatollah, uh, like Khatami. Like we have to recognize that as or, or Montazer, as soon as they have made progressive remarks, they have been banned from appearing to, in the media, um, and and the regime continues to suppress the aspects of religion that doesn't convenience them, while promoting aspect of religion that actually helps them stay in power. And um, sticking to aspects of Sharia law that suppresses women is one of the um, aspects of um, religion that they push and continue to insist upon because when they suppress 50% of the population, they, um, they, they keep alive a system of oppression that ultimately empowers them and keeps them in power. Um, so yes, there, is, there are strong religious roots in Iran, but there's also a very strong movement away from religion, including from the highest level of Iranian clergy. Thank you. I, I think we're gonna have to draw to a close now, but... Uh, uh... It just struck me one thing that you said, Michael, perhaps the United Nations should be uh, more involved. And I think of the, uh, the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, which are, of course, the number one of two, uh, two or three is, is to, do with, uh, is, is to do with gender and equality for women. Mm. Whether the United Nations should actually be um, getting more, more vocal about this specific, uh, the specific problem. I'm going to well, ask you that. Clear, one question. clear demand, Michael, one clear demand that could be made across the board is for Iran to allow UN rapporteurs, not just on Iran itself, but on other uh, uh, aspects such as gender, uh, such as violence against women. Uh, there are, these rapporteurs exist, and they have been denied access to the country 
Now, there should be there should be a demand, a unanimous demand from all nations in the UN for such access to be allowed, unfettered access to be allowed to these yeah. rapporteurs. Fine, thanks. Just I was going to ask you one comment on that. Yeah, um, so just that's just yours, very, Michael. Sanam, yes. Very, very quickly. So we, I've been involved in, in the Women, Peace and Security agenda um, of the Security Council since, since its inception. And this is a moment for the Security Council to actually bring Iran under that agenda to the Security Council in terms of in terms of women's security, women's protection, and so forth. Similarly, April is actually the month that the Security Council often looks at sexual violence in conflict and the use of sexual violence by state actors and others. Again, we have incidences of, the, of, of this of this type of abuse. It's time to use those instruments to bring Iran into that space and 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 have it. Um, be taken seriously. So I agree. I, th I think that that we have to use our multilateral tools and and systems and really be consistent. And there's now a movement to try and make gender apartheid and, and, illeg and Ill illegal in international law. And again, depending on the criteria, I think Iran also fits in there. So we have to use the rule of law that we have um, and, and universal human rights as mechanisms to try and bring about the change or, or some of the mitigation, because, because I also worry about using women's rights or any of these things, again, as a way of promoting war, which we've also seen in the region in, in the past. And, and that's that's not a good outcome for women. No, or what, we're, what we're talking about is the development goals, uh, which are which are wide, which because the gender one is 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 specific within them. However, uh, Ali, uh, can you do you want to make a one one comment about United Nations? Uh, yes, I completely agree. The UN should be uh, much more involved in this situation. Uh, but at the same time, I would also urge people to look at continuity across regimes as well. There are certain problems in Iran that are not just with one regime or the other. There are continuous problems. By the way, the Shah is largely responsible for bringing about the Islamic Republic. It was the Shah's policies that strengthened mosques. <clears throat> he built thousands and thousands of mosques and made the connections between mosques and networks and religious groups very strong because he believed they would defeat the communists. He thought the left wing was the danger. I believe he was misled by the CIA, actually. <laughs> OK, that's those one. And Marjan, your final comment, please, before I hand back to Sandy. I think one of the important um, evolutionary steps that need to happen in order for this movement to succeed is acceptance of responsibility and acceptance of mistakes. Um, in order, we have, uh, whether it's committed by um, rulers or by the people, I think that um, you can look into um, who are the perpetrators or who are the um, contributors to the failures of the past in Iran. And I think that while um, maybe rulers of the past have contributed to those uh, problems, the people have contributed it and by, by, by taking the vote, by taking to the streets. Um, we have to have a moment of reckoning and a reconciliation with ourselves as, as citizens um, in order to be able to reconcile and um, reckon with, uh, with our enemies. Um, you, you cannot put all the blame for the mistakes of the past on the author authorities. People contributed to the problems as well. And we all have to take collective responsibility and in order to push forward our collective dream for a secular and free democracy in Iran. Well, uh, again, that's related to the whole concept of what the United Nations should be about. And, uh, uh, and let's hope that that may be some kind of answer. Uh, Sandy, uh, back to you after what has been a, a really uh, excellent discussion today. Yes, uh, very quickly, we've swept by our self-imposed time limit here, Mike. Yeah, so, yeah sorry about uh, that. That's all right. It's no one's fault. Um, but I, I do want to try to respect the time of our participants and and our panelists. Uh, this has been a wonderful discussion. I think we've had some nuances of the of the points of view that were very helpful and uh, forward looking. And so I'm grateful to all our panelists for making that happen and to all our participants for tuning in. 
thanks, of course, as always, to our support network at Georgetown University, John McCabe, um, Tom Banchoff, the president, Jack DeJoya, who have encouraged this series and encouraged the both projects to continue along in the difficult times of the pandemic. So uh, onward to the next one, Mike. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Sandy. May I give my thanks also to our panelists. Thank you very much for such an engaging uh, hour, and, hour and 20 minutes rather than 15 minutes, but thank you very much for that. Uh, the next free speech project at Crossroads International Dialogues event in association with the Future of the Humanities Project will be on Wednesday, May the 3rd. Now, that's earlier in May than we would usually plan, but that happens to be World Press Day. So we're going to do something on uh, freedom of the press on World Press Day. I'd also like to mention that uh, Tuesday, 25th of April, in the Literature, Arts and Environment series, uh, Sheila Kapoor from, uh, from Georgetown will be discussing a people's atlas of nuclear Colorado which sounds intriguing to say the least. <laughs> My thanks, uh, of course, to, to colleagues at, at uh, Georgetown, also to colleagues at Blackfriars, uh, John O'Connor, the Regent, Richard Finn, the Director of Las Casas Institute at Campion Hall, uh, Nick Austin, the Campion uh, Hall Master. Uh, also, my thanks to uh, John McCabe, to Laura Lees, my publicist in the UK, and as ever to Maggie Scott, uh, who all helped to put these programs together. And my thanks to you, the audience. Uh, I didn't, we didn't get through all of the questions, but I, I realized that some of the questions had been answered during the course of the, of, of the debate, or at least discussed. So uh, thank you all for putting in those, those questions and for attending today. Uh, I'm Professor Mike Scott, Fellow and Senior Dean at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. You can follow me on Twitter at Mike Scott Prof. Until next time, take care. Keep safe. And again, my thanks to all our colleagues on the panel. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.